So, hope you all had a nice uh, meal. Um, now uh, we're going to uh, hear uh, Mark Thomas uh, tell us what you have to do to migrate your applications to run on Tomcat 8. All right, thank you. So, um, what I want to look at um, in this presentation is, first of all, the, the specification changes you need to be aware of when you're moving to Tomcat 8. Then the, the, sort of the Tomcat specific changes. So if you're on Tomcat and you're used to either 6 or 7, what might have changed on a, sort of a pure Tomcat side that might catch you out. I'll wrap up with a bit of summary. Questions-wise, I'm happy to take them as we go along. Um, for those of you that are here for the SSL talk, I've got a little bit less material for this one, so there should be plenty of time for questions, so feel free to uh, ask as we go. Yeah, I think we can pretty much skip through this. Uh, there might be a quiz on these slides later, but for now, um, why do I want to talk about this? Well, there's lots of information out there about what are all the new features in Tomcat 8. I mean, I've given some of the presentations. Um, other people I recognize in this room have given presentations about what's new in Tomcat 8. So what I wanted to focus on was what might break when you take something that works beautifully on Tomcat 6 or Tomcat 7 or potentially another application server and run it on Tomcat 8? What might catch you out? What's likely to go wrong? So there's really two aspects to it. First of all, there's the J2E specifications. These are meant to be backwards compatible. Um, and in some cases, they bend over backwards and make life a complete pain for members of the expert group, and I say that with feeling, in order to keep the backwards compatibility. But there are still places where it's broken, and there are a couple of places that I'll cover that genuinely could cause problems for your application, so I'll make sure you're aware of those. And then there's the Tomcat side of things. Um, we, we're a little bit more flexible than the Java EE groups are generally. We will pretty much freely break any Tomcat API from one major version to the next. Um, and we've done that quite spectacularly in a few places in Tomcat 8. So I want to make you aware of those so that if you are using any Tomcat specific features, then you know what might bite you as you move to 8. So first of all, let's look at the specifications. In Tomcat 8, we're talking about four specifications. So it's Servlet 3.1, JSP 2.3, EL 3.0, and the new one for Tomcat 8, which is WebSocket. Um, I'm not actually going to cover them in that order. I'm sort of going to try and do the um, sort of easiest first. First of all, the expression language. Um, there's one big change that is pretty much guaranteed to bite you if you're using expression language. And if you're using um, Java server faces, it's almost certainly going to bite you. Um, and it's how EL handles nulls. And when you have... Um, a little, a little um, expression that says, yeah, just set the value of this text box to whatever, whatever, whatever EL expression. In EL 2.2 and earlier, it was the bane of JSF developers' lives that if you had a null, so you, you, try, you, you pull an object or you populate an object from the database and then you want to use that to put it in the form. If it's actually a clean object and most of the fields are null, you don't, get no, you don't just get blank values in the form. If they're numbers, they get coerced to zero. If they're characters, they get coerced to zero, of all things. Um, and if they're Booleans, they get coerced to false. You don't get the nulls, which just causes you a whole heap of pain and things you have to deal with. So to deal with that, Tomcat um, introduced this system property, org Apache EL, parser coerced to zero, which pretty much everybody um, sets to false. So, the, so basically, it's specification non-compliant. We, we want the nulls. If we say null, that's what we want to come out of it. Um, otherwise, you get all sorts of problems with forms being populated with the wrong values and things. Uh, that problem was recognized in EL 3.0, so that was changed. So if it's a null, if it's, if it's trying to coerce a number character or Boolean, it will actually coerce them to nulls, which is great for the people that were um, using the Tomcat system property. Not so great for those people that spent a lot of time coding around this problem, assuming that the spec wasn't going to change. And now it's just gone back and it's going to bite you the other way. Um, so fortunately, for, in Tomcat, it's actually fairly easy to deal with. You just set the system property to be whatever you want it to be. Um, the default has changed between com Tomcat 7 and Tomcat 8, but you, the property still exists, so you can set it for whatever behavior. So whilst it has the potential to be very disruptive, the system property just flicks it straight back to um, how it was in Tomcat 7. And the great thing for us was implementing this was really easy. It was just a five characters to four character change in the... Uh, setting the default. So, yeah, we'll just change the default. Oh, look, whole part of specification all implemented. I like things like that. So it's dead easy. Just set it back to true if you want the 2.2 behavior. 
So that's really the, the, the thing that's going to bite with expression language. And there are other things in there as well. There's new syntax, um, new characters that might, if you really try very hard, catch you out. But they'll be very, they'll be very easy to work, work, work around. So I'm not really going to cover that in, in a great deal of detail. The next one is I'm going to look at the JSP 2.3 spec. There are some minor changes just to reflect the changes that are in the expression language. Otherwise, there's really only one other change. Um, and if you look at a servlet container, or rather a JSP container in 2.2, then if you send an HTTP request to a JSP, it isn't actually defined anywhere which HTTP methods it's meant to respond to and which ones it isn't meant to respond to. So Tomcat, by default, responds to, in, certainly in Tomcat 7 and earlier, responds to all HTTP methods, which means so does Glassfish, so does Jetty, so versions of JBoss that are based on pretty much all of the open source ones because they pretty much all use the same implementation, give or take. They're all going to respond to everything. Now, that's normally not a problem. It usually doesn't make much sense with a JSP to do anything other than get, post, or head. And you do a, you do a delete on it, well, it's very unlikely to do anything. It just, because, for what, because GSPs are really there to, sort of to present the view of the data, it, it's unlikely you're going to want to use any of the other HTTP verbs. However, um, there are applications out there that do, that do do slightly different things, depending on, say, get or post. They might, they might update something versus view something. And they might have some permissions on that JSP set up in, as security constraints that do think, say things like, well, if it, to use post, you've got to be a member of this group. To use get, you've got to be a member of this group. And that's fine and dandy, apart from a little problem called HTTP verb tampering, which mean normally, a, if, you, if you send a, an HTTP verb to a servlet, it doesn't understand. It just says, no idea what you're talking about, unknown HTTP method. So if rather than doing a you know, get slash, get space slash slash HTTP 1.1 1, 1 .1 to do a get request to the root, if you did a foobar space slash uh, space HTTP uh, slash 1.1, do that to a server. It'll say, foobar, no idea what HTTP method that is. Do it to a GSP. It says, yeah, sure, here you go. Here's the content. And the problem there is if your security constraints only enumerate the HTTP methods you're expecting, the request for foobar will go right past that and do whatever the default is, which hopefully is only the get. If it's the post, you might have real problems. Um, so... That creates a whole bunch of problems, and there's an incredibly long-winded discussion in the server expert group about how to deal with verb tampering. Um, and I tried and failed to take the position that we've got all the, all the configuration options we need for people to implement this securely. They just need to do it. Because you basically, what you should do is say, uh, this constraint is for get, this constraint is for post, this constraint is for anything apart from get and post. And you just need to make sure that those two match so you've covered all possible verbs. And quite a few people don't. Um, and I, what I was trying to set my position was, well, that's a configuration problem. By all means, warn them that they've made, a, they've made a possible configuration problem, but we don't need yet another configuration option to deal with this. What we got was yet another configuration option to deal with this, but worry about that when we talk about servers. Getting back to this, the main problem we it was felt we needed to do something was verb tampering in JSPs because by default they respond to everything. So what we did in JSP 2.3 was say, right, um, JSPs will respond to get, they will respond to post, they will respond to head, everything else is, remains undefined. And undefined in Tomcat means no, we don't, we just reject the request. So it does mean if you're using JSPs with weird HTTP methods, then in Tomcat 8 they're going to break. And I don't believe I got around to implementing the configuration option to allow you to change that. But if I didn't and you need it, open an enhancement request, and we, it's not that difficult to do. Um, I think we just came to the conclusion that nobody would need it. But if that conclusion's wrong, let us know, and it's, it's a pretty trivial fix. OK, next one, um, WebSocket. So Tomcat 7 initially shipped with a proprietary WebSocket API that I basically made up. Um, along, and it was made up on the basis of, well, this is what the WebSocket specification has to do. These are the Tomcat internals I've got to work with. What API is the, it makes most sense, is easiest to work with. So that, that's pretty much how the API evolved. It was f more to do with how easy it was for me to implement than it was for people to use. It wasn't completely crazy, but it, that was really the, the primary driver for how it evolved. 
So Tomcat 8 ships with the JSR 356 WebSocket implementation, so the standard available in all the containers, Java WebSocket 1.0 API. We've also backported that to Tomcat 7, and at the same time said, yeah, that, that proprietary thing that Mark made up, that was great, but yeah, no, that's deprecated. We're not going to use that anymore. Um, if you find a bug, yeah, we'll fix it, but it's been removed completely in Tomcat 8. It doesn't, the code doesn't even exist. Um, there is a very strong push that you, know, you really should be using the, the standard WebSocket API. Um, so if you are using the proprietary one, you need to migrate. And right, 142.47.33. Right, let's see if we can get this right. Because so what I want to do is show you um, 42.47.33 is how we did this for one of the Tomcat apps. Apache.org. 4733. Excellent. That's what, I hope, that's what I was hoping to see. Right. So what we've got here is the commit that took the web, the snake example from WebSocket, which is just a simple snake game. Um, I do like the fact that Tomcat now ships with a game by default. Um, how we con how we took this and converted it from the old proprietary API to the new API. And what I want you to show is okay, this is a relatively simple example, and it's not trivial, but uh, just how easy it was to do that conversion. So what we started with was, um, uh, there's not much scope for scrolling down here, is that now? So what we started with was this uh, servlet, and that was how we did it with the proprietary API. That, the code that's in there actually gets split between this timer and the annotation, which is essentially new. That's the new thing that does the, um, the WebSocket stuff. And really, those probably should have been split in the original implementation as well. They, they are separate concepts. And it probably would have been better if the servlet had moved to the annotation and the timer had been extracted, but that was just not the way I ended up doing the, do, doing the copy and the commit. Um, that servlet then got deleted, so essentially it got replaced by the timer. And the snake bit and the location bit, which were just sort of objects for the app, they just got edited. So I'll do those first, because they're actually really easy. Um, so to give you an idea of the sort of thing that had a chain, oops. I want text changed. So here it's just a case of, yeah, really nothing changed here at all. We just had to change some constants because we changed the class it, names of the classes that we're using. So that's easy. That's really, that's kind of a, yeah, the IDE will just deal with that. I don't have to worry about it change. Um, this one is the snake. This is slightly more complicated. Here what we've replaced is, the, actually can I make this bigger? Uh, oh, it's a Windows, not a Mac. Uh, oh, fine, we'll, just, we'll go with it. Uh, no, not like that. Just, no. Give up. Right. Um, apologies if you have to squint. So what we essentially do here is, in the old proprietary API, the object that you used to talk to your clients was, was a... Uh, so it's called this outbound object, WebSocket outbound, WS outbound. In the, the Java WebSocket, JSR 356, that's replaced by the WebSocket session. So essentially, all that's really changed here is we've, got, we've replaced outbound with session. So keep, rather than keeping a record of the, the outbound, we keep a copy of the session. We pass in the session rather than the outbound. Uh, that's just a straight change. That's just the renaming stuff. And the, the send messages are slightly different. Uh, rather than having to do, and there's a little bit of refactoring going on here as well, but let me just scroll down. Uh, rather than having to yeah, create a character buffer and basically wrap this text inside a character buffer, it's a little bit simpler in that we just use the send message. And you just say, yeah, get the remote, send the string. I and mean, that's, it's, you just don't have to wrap it with a character buffer, really. So again, that's a pretty trivial change to make. And then I think these other ones, don't, it's just more constants changing again. So really, the, the outbound and the session are pretty much a one-to-one -one mapping. And how you write the data has changed slightly. But again, it's all fairly, you can almost do it with a straight um, global search and replace. It's not quite that simple, but it's pretty close. Uh, so still pretty easy stuff. Um, right, uh, WebInf was easy, just remove all the, all the WebSocket stuff. Because we do it with annotate, we can use annotations now. And all the WebSocket examples largely are done with annotation. So you just yeah, delete anything you're doing in web.xml for the proprietary API. That's, again, nice and easy. 
The slightly harder bit is this one here, where we're splitting up the, um, the t what was the servlet into the timer and the annotation. So as I said, there's really two aspects to this. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of what you're seeing here is being deleted is stuff that moved into the, the annotation bit. Uh, but let's see if we've got some comparable code further down. Yeah. So again, and this method here where it's doing a, um, yeah, in fact, that's just, that's just refactoring for the split. It's all pretty much pull it out, leave it alone. And the, the, again, the send messages stuff, you don't need to wrap it with the character buffer, but you'll see that in the annotation. Um, so all pretty simple. That's just been moved out. So it's just been deleted. And that's, yeah, again, constants changing, gets, stuff gets moved out. So if you go and have a look at the annotation, which is where sort of the, it's the new one where the real work gets done. A lot of this is just a straight copy of stuff that got deleted from the timer one. Uh, the bit that's slightly different is the methods that you're putting the stuff in. You've now got the annotations that at WebSocket on open, so this will get called um, when the connection is created. On at WebSocket message, that will get called when a message is received. So the, the methods have changed a bit, and you've put the annotations on there, and there'll be an annotation on the class as well, just to define the endpoint. And that's basically what let us rip all that stuff out of web.xml. But it's all pretty simple stuff, fairly easy to do. Uh, I think it took me probably about, I don't know, 40 minutes to go through and convert all of the Tomcat examples from the old one to the new API. And so there was a chat example in there. There was a simple, there was echo. We had programmatic and annotation to do there. There was the snake. And then the drawing board got added later. And so it's all pretty simple to do. Um, but obviously, if you're using the proprietary API, you're going to have to do that to move to Tomcat 8. Right, Servlet 3.1. Um, moving on. Session ID changes by default on authentication. That's to prevent session fixation. <coughs> Browsers won't care. Browsers will just carry on working. Um, Java applets might get confused if you're using those. If you've got anything that's so that a more, more programmatic client that isn't expecting the session ID to change, this will catch it out. You can turn this off. I really recommend that you don't. Um, you know, session fixation is a genuine security issue, and really, this is the only way to deal with it. Um, I should point out, it doesn't create a new session. It just changes the ID. So if you've got a session object, and you've put a whole pile of data in it, and you then, then you authenticate. All that happens is that the ID changes. All of the data you've put in that session is still there, is still accessible. We literally just change the value of the ID field on the session object. Um, oh, yeah, annotation scanning. This is, most of this has actually been backported to Tomcat 7 now. So you might see some of this if you're on an earlier version of 7 moving up to a later 7 or onto 8. There was a lack of clarity in the Servlet 3 spec about exactly how this was meant to work, combined with, I, I guess I could best describe it as a hopeful misreading of the specification on my part, because um, I really didn't think anybody would be as stupid as we, the expert group actually was. Um, so we've tightened up how the annotation scanning works in 8 and 7. So annotation scanning if you're on a Tomcat 7 or Tomcat 8 or any container that is a Servlet 3.0 or higher container, irrespective of what version you declare in web.xml, annotation scanning always happens. Um, so even if you're declaring version 2.5 in web.xml, if you've got an at web server or servlet or at web listener or at web filter, they will get processed, they will get added to your application. That might be a little bit surprising. Because it means you can take, so particularly say you've, if you've got an application that's based on the newer Spring libraries, you run that on Tomcat 6, no annotation scanning, everything's hunky-dory. Run it on Tomcat 7, all of a sudden Spring's listener kicks in. That's, that, does the, that does all the initialization automatically. Meanwhile, you've, just, you've defined the same listener in web.x. When it tries to do it again, it all gets very confused. It either falls over or configuration gets completely messed up. And and to my mind, that shouldn't happen, but 
and Tomcat didn't used to do this. It used, basically used to say, we won't, if, if you serve at 2.5 or earlier, we won't scan for annotations, because clearly that's not what you intended. But we got overruled on that one. Um, so it does mean that applications can change behavior as they move from six and earlier to seven and later, or from particularly earlier versions of seven. There are ways to avoid some of this, and it's all to do with how you use the absolute ordering elements in the web.xml. But that means you've got to be using version three or later in your web.xml. If you define an absolute order, then jars that you exclude from that order are not scanned for servlet container initializers. They are not scanned for classes. Because, oh, and servlet container initializers, they can have handle type um, annotations. It's basically say, tell me about every class that implements this interface or, or is a, uh, this class or a subclass of it. But if it glass, jars is excluded, it's never scanned for matches for an SCI handles type, and it's never scanned for annotations. So the easiest way to get faster startup, assuming you're not using annotations, is put an empty absolute ordering element in your version 3 web.xml, and it just turns off all of the scanning. Um, nice and easy. Metadata complete does not control scanning for SCIs. So even if you set, if you set metadata complete to true, that will disable the scanning for servlets, filters, and listeners but it won't stop the SCI scanning. So you need, you need metadata complete, true, and an absolute ordering, an empty absolute ordering element in order to turn off all of the scanning. On the SCI front, container-provided SCIs are always loaded. You can't turn them off through the spec. You can with a Tomcat-specific option. And the reason for that is Tomcat actually uses SCIs to load both Jasper and WebSocket, and you don't want to disable those. Well, so you might want to disable WebSocket, which is why we let you do it as a Tomcat-specific. Um, there are some more sort of details that got clarified around async processing. If you try and use ASIC from the async context, if you try and get the request or the response, and you're not actually doing async processing at the time, I think previously Tomcat let you get away with it. Now it doesn't. It throws an illegal state exception. It said, no, you shouldn't be doing that. Stop. Um, we've added, there's a default timeout. Uh, the EG has defined that as 30 seconds. I think Tomcat had a default of 10 seconds prior. Um, but we've now backported that default to Tomcat 7 as well. Um, and it, the EG also defined what happens if you have an async listener, and it throws an unchecked exception during, um, during processing one of its methods. The answer is, fine, that gets logged, but the other listeners carry on being fired. So one listener can't stop subsequent listeners firing. Again, that was something that was inconsistent between the containers. So that's the spec changes. So. There's a few things there that might catch you out, and then there's the Tomcat stuff. So uh, we've changed the default connector from blocking I.O. to non-blocking I.O. That's primarily because with all of the non-blocking functionality that's been introduced into the servlet spec, so the hoops you have to jump through and the fudges you have to implement in the blocking I.O. connector to make it look like it's doing non-blocking, even when it isn't, have just got to the point where it's just not it's, the code's ugly. I, I desperately want to delete it. it just, it's just not worth trying to maintain it anymore. Um, so it's, dep it's likely to get, get deprecated at 8 and dropped for 9. We just need to have a discussion within the, the community to confirm that everybody's happy with that. Um, you shouldn't notice any change in terms of configuration. There's only one option that BIO supports that NIO doesn't, and it's completely irrelevant for NIO because it's dealing with a problem that's unique to BIO. The problem with BIO is because it's always one thread, one connection, if you've got keep alive, what could happen is if you've got 200 threads in your thread pool, 200 connections all using keep alive, you've got, you've got an exhausted thread pool and you can't serve any new connections. So what that does is by default it says once I've got 75% of my thread pool doing keep alive, the remaining 25% won't ever. So those 25% just all, can always be available to process new connections. So it just stops the whole thing locking up. You don't have that problem with NIO, because NIO is as many connections as you like, well, as, depending on how many ports you've got. I think the default limit's 10,000 connections. But it's then, th uh, the thread pool is only used to process the th connection when there's data on that connection to process. So if you've got 10,000 Keep Alive connections, it doesn't matter. The thread pool, you'll still have 200 <coughs> spare threads there until one of those connections has got some data to process, and then that will get allocated a thread, and off it goes. Because NIO uses polling to make all of that happen, you might notice a little increase in CPU usage, maybe, possibly. Um, I'll be surprised if you can actually measure it, but you might be able to. If you tweak some of the connector settings and really force 
some sort of heavy polling, then you might just about be able to measure it. The big change between seven and eight, and the one that might catch people out, is static resources. In Tomcat 7, we have a whole bunch of features. Um, there's aliases that lets you map a directory on the, on the system into a URL space in the web app. There's virtual loader that lets you take jars and classes that are else, elsewhere on the file system and map them into a web app. There's the virtual DIR context that, oh, lets you map a directory into the URL space of the web app. That sounds strangely familiar. There's jar resources that lets you take content that's, and this is part of the spec, the others aren't, um, meta -inf, content from MetaInf resources in a jar file that's wrapped with, shipped with the app, and, oh, map it into the URL space of the app. Actually, it's fixed mapping into the root, but it's, a, it's the same thing. External repositories let you, oh, add external jar files and classes and other repositories on URLs into the web application class. Editor. They're all variations on a theme. Unfortunately, they're all implemented differently. There is separate, in Tomcat 7, there is separate code to implement each of those features. Um, to call the code fragile would be an understatement. Um, you, you, you breathe on this code and you create regressions. Um, just, I mean, just in a small change to virtual DIR context broke reloading in Eclipse. Um, it, it, the code was horrible. And the scary thing was that the Servlet 3 expert group was planning on implementing a feature called overlays where you could have sort of what was known as a template war file that would have a whole pile of common stuff in it. And then you could have an actual war file that would then sort of customize that with either slightly different CSS or different parameters for this, or maybe a few different pages here and there. And it was all to do with the, uh, their multi-tenancy stuff. The idea being you'd have this template war file, then each of your tenants would have their own overlay. And you could update the template war file, and it would update all the application for all of the tenants in one go. Great idea. It was the first thing that I decided to implement for Tomcat 8. And I implemented, started working the right. First of all, I need to clean this up. So this got a complete rewrite. Just as I'd finished it, they dropped the feature, which I was less than happy about. But on the, on the plus side, we'd actually got all of this re, rewritten in. It's a heck of a lot easier to um, support. And it's all got unit tests now, which is far more than could be said for the, the last lot of code. So there is a completely new implementation for static resources. Um, everything's all been merged into a single framework. Everything you could do before, you can still do, and you can do more. The, the configuration is completely new, um, and caching, all the configuration to do with caching has moved from the context, and it's been put into the new um, web resources configuration. What you do now is you can define resources as the main resources. That's essentially what ships with the war file. You've got pre-resources, so that those are things that, when Tomcat searches for a static resource, it checks the pre-resources, then the main, then the jars, then the post. So essentially, pre-resources can be used to override anything that's in the web app. Jar resources are the standard uh, servlet specification jar resources, so they always get checked after the main resources. And post resources are kind of the, the option of last resort. If I haven't defined it in any of these, well, it's, it'll pick up the version that's there. And each of those um, can be, uh, have we missed the types? Yeah. Uh, yeah, what I've missed from here is you've, there are three different implementations of each of these. Each of these can point to a jar file or a directory or an individual file, and you can have as many of them. Sorry, there's only ever one main resources, but you can have as many pre-resources and as many jar resources and as many post-resources as you like. Generally, you wouldn't bother setting this up. Tomcat does that for you. It's the pre and the post that you're going to worry about. But you can do things like, oh, yeah, that jar file over there, um, the, uh, you know, 10 levels of directory down, map that contact to this completely different path over here in the web application, if you want to. Um, and each of those resources that you define, there are a number of attributes you, can, attributes you need to find. The base is basically where to find it. Where's the jar file? Where's the directory? Where's the file? The internal path is the, and it's prim this is primarily makes sense for jars, but and makes no sense at all for files. It, you can use it with directories, but why would you? Could you just specify a different base? But the internal path is the path within the jar file to the root of the resources you want to serve. The web app mount is the path within the web application you want those resources to be served at. And read-only is whether or not you want them to be read-only or whether you want them to be read-write. Normally, you'd go for read-only. But if you would, if you make, if you're, say, using WebDAV to make the web application remotely editable by certain users, you might want to make, some, say, some external files or external directories read-write. But you've got the choice there. 
Um, so that's the resources. The configuration is all for it is all in the Tomcat 8 docs. So if you're using any of those Tomcat 7 features, then you'll need to migrate that across. Internal APIs, we've changed quite a few things. It's all clean up, basically. Um, manager load and resources, were def you, and you could define a session manager for a single servlet. Why? And it, it created a whole pile of unnecessary code, a whole pile of pointless casts. So we just got rid of all of that and just moved the session manager, the class loader, and the static resources to the web application, because it's the only object that ever used them. Um, so that enabled us to do some cleanup. Uh, the mapper, that's the component that says, well, I've got this URL. Which host does it go to? Which context does it go to? Which servlet does it go to? We had, if you had three connectors, say HTTP, HTTPS, and AJP, we had three instances of the mapper. They were all identically configured. If you deployed a new web application, all three of them had to be updated. Um, and it was basically, it, it was multiple copies of the same data because of where the mapper was sat in the hierarchy. We moved the mapper from the connector to the service, and now there's only one of them, so we've saved a bit of memory, and it's quicker to update, and it's easier to manage, and da 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 da, da, da. We've talked about the web resources stuff. The general message here is if you're using a Tomcat internal API, check the Java doc, check what you're doing, um, still compiles. If it doesn't, you might have a few changes to make. If we've done something that really breaks it for you, uh, then yeah, let us know. Um, we have been known to revert some of these changes. If, if, if there's a strong case for restoring the old functionality or the old API, um, it, if we've broken something really badly, Tommy, um, which we've done a couple of times with some of the cleanup, then yeah, let us know and we can, we can do something to fix it. It might not be a, com a complete revert, but we'll put some feature in there that lets you do what you're doing before, hopefully as easily. Um, database connection pools. Tomcat 7 and earlier is based on Commons DBCP 1. Tomcat 8 is based on Commons DBCP 2. It's, DBCP 2 has much better performance in environments where you have multiple threads trying to either check out or return connections at the same time. Now, there's not actually that many applications that have large numbers of threads doing that, but where they do, you'll see, you should see a big performance difference. Um, JDBC pool is still a little bit quicker than DBCP2 by default, but that's by default it does less than DBCP2. If you actually have an apples to apples configuration comparison, they're close enough that you're not going to notice the difference in the real world. You're talking about microseconds difference in borrowing a connection or returning it, and most database operations are measured in milliseconds anyway, so you're orders of magnitude away from what you're ever going to notice. Um, there are some changes to the names of the configuration attributes, though, um, and this will bite you in Tomcat. Uh, max active needs to be renamed to max total. Uh, max weight needs to be renamed to max weight willies. Uh, mi willies? Millies, even. Um, validation no longer requires a validation query. If you enable validation and you don't specify a validation query, in Tomcat 8, it will just use connection is valid to check whether the connection is valid. One of the things that we're going to discuss in the Tomcat Summit on Friday, I suspect it'll be a fairly short discussion, is should we be nice and at least warn users if we spot this problem? Or could, should we even be really nice and fix it for them and warn them? Um, at, the, at the minute, the answer is we don't, we don't spot it, we don't warn you, we don't do anything, we just let it go horribly wrong without telling you. I suspect I know how we're going to fix that. Um, as someone who's bounced back and forth between 7 and 8 a lot recently, yep. Yes. <laughs> yep. Because it won't complain if it doesn't recognize it. Correct. Uh, but I think, what we, I think we can make that easier for people. Um, right. This hasn't happened yet. It's going to happen. And it's the one thing that is really standing now between Tomcat 8 and Tomcat 8 being stable. The cookie specifications are basically a mess. Uh, it started off with the Netscape spec, informally known as version 0. That's full of holes. Um, you could drive a truck through some of the gaps in that spec. There's lots of things that aren't defined, lots of things that are ambiguous. Um, so that clearly needed, needed, needed fixing. So it was fixed with RFC 2109, which is no, that's Cookies version 1. That's generally OK. It fixes most of the problem. There's a few holes in it, but in the grand scheme of things, it would work. It would be nice if the browsers had actually implemented it. Most of them haven't, or they've partially implemented it or they've skipped some bits, or they've taken a few shortcuts. And generally, it's an, when we had a fix, some, the cookie handling in Tomcat to deal with some security issues. 
and we ended up with strict RFC 2109, and it broke for just about every single break. And we, we were getting yelled at for months on the users and the dev list about the stuff we broke. Um, some, and we, we were yelling back a little bit, saying, yeah, your cookie's not valid. You can't put that character in a cookie. And we won some of those arguments, but we lost quite a few of them as well. It's all back to the, the, the browsers weren't implementing it. Now, there were some, as I said, some small deficiencies in version 1. So there's RFC 2965 version 2 that fixed all of those that nobody implements. Um, it's just completely ignored. Um, yet, generally, cookies are one of these, you know, we all use them, and it all pretty much works. How on earth did that manage to happen? Well, luck rather than judgment, I think. Uh, the, the browser vendors, vendors have pretty much converged on what they viewed was, as a sensible way of doing things. The server vendor said, well, if that's what the browsers are sending us, then we'll write the parsing code to make sure we can deal with it. And you kind of got this unofficial, this is what everybody understands what's meant to happen, but it's not written down anywhere specification. And there were some small inconsistencies, as you'd expect, across that. So the response to that was right. OK, clearly writing a specification and expecting people to implement it where cookies concerned isn't going to happen. So the best we can do is document what they're actually doing. And that's what RFC 20, uh, 6265 does. Um, and there's a few places where it does try and cl clean things up and tighten it up. But broadly, it's, um, it specifies what the browsers are expecting. So Tomcat currently tries to do 2109 with a bunch of workarounds. Um, whilst uh, Jeremy was looking at this, he found a whole bunch of bugs in the stuff that we do that. And it's all going to fall over anyway as soon as HTML5 starts, gets into wider use and people start putting UTF-8 in cookies. Because UTF-8 in HTTP headers is always a good place to start. <sighs> um, it, it's doable if you quote it properly, but people re you, the server needs to expect it, expect it to be there. Otherwise, um, the UTF-8 starts to look like line terminators, and you get headers breaking across lines. It all gets very messy very quickly. So there's a very thorough review of the current state that Jeremy's done. That's documented on the Tomcat wiki, um, along with a whole bunch of proposed solutions, which I think pretty much that's a good plan. It's what we need to do. We just need to get on and do it. And that's pretty much my next big piece of work to try and do. I strongly encourage you to have a look at that, review it, and comment. If you think we're doing something wrong, now's the time to comment. It's much easier to fix it before we start writing code than afterwards. Um, so please have a look at that. Give us some, have us some feedback. Let us know what you think um, before the work starts. I say that's going to happen pretty soon. Um, yeah, the, the thing, I've said pretty much all of that. The thing I haven't said is what we're proposing to do for the cookies should nearly be always be backwards compatible. There might be a few edge cases, but generally it, it should work. But whenever we touch the cookie code, somebody ends up screaming. So the sooner you review it, the sooner you test the early versions of Tomcat that have got implementations of this, the sooner we get the feedback, the sooner we can fix it. We can work out what additional knobs we need to add so people can configure it so it works for their particular system. Like I say, the details are all on the wiki. So in summary, you're, you might get effect, implement, impacted by the cookies. Generally, uh, is it unlikely going to be affected? Probably. Um, it should be a pretty smooth upgrade. I mean, for instance, Jira, not the simplest of web applications in the world, um, and technically not supported if you run it on Tomcat 8. Um, but hey, what, what, where's the harm in running the ASF to Jira instance on Tomcat 8? It's not like it's huge or anything. Uh, but we did it, and it's fine. Um, we did uncover a couple of Jira bugs in the process, but they were to do with um, class loading and signed jars and breaking rules about sealing and loading classes from the same package from signed and unsigned jars. And because Tomcat 8 was, was ordering the jars in a different order because of the different static resources implementation, that tripped over the Jira bug. But we could just define a pre-resource, say, yeah, just make sure you always load this jar first, and then that avoided all of the problems. So it, it's been incredibly smooth. I mean, Jira's been up now, I think it's probably about three or four weeks since I last rebooted it for an upgrade. Um, it's completely solid, no issues at all. Memory usage is you know, standard sawtooth, not steadily rising. Um, so it is certainly possible to take a fairly complex app that ran on 7, supported on 7, tested on 7, and just drop it on 8 and have it work largely. 
Um, you're unlikely to get hit by the sorts of bugs that we got hit, hit by with Jira. So it is being, you know, Tomcat 8 is being used in production. It is being, it is being tested. Um, and if you want to switch and you hit, and you can pretty much switch now, say it's only the cookies stuff that's, that's holding it back from having the stable label. If you do hit a problem, help's always available on the, on the user's list. That's generally the first place to start. Even if you think you've got a bug, I'd suggest starting on the user's list and saying, I'm seeing this, is it a bug? Because that would be far better received than posting on the dev list saying, I found a bug, I need to be found. Actually, no, it's not. That's a configuration problem. The, the community as a whole is far more tolerant of dev questions on the user's list than they are user's questions on the dev list. So if you're not at all sure, start on the user's list and you'll be fine. Okay, um, I've actually managed to stick to time, which is quite miraculous. Uh, got a few minutes left for questions. Nario, there must be one somewhere. Okay, well, while you're thinking some questions, we're going to do a little bit of audience participation. Who's currently using Tomcat's Five or earlier in production? Good answer. Ooh. Yeah. Right, who's currently using Tomcat 6 in production? 7? 8? Oh, just me. Okay. That, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, that, that's sort of about what, I, what I'd expect now. Generally, the folks that have been using 8 have been using it in dev. They've been testing with it. Um, but it is, it's, it's certain, you should certainly be thinking about using it in dev, and I think you can start planning to use it in, in production now. So now I've just given you a few minutes of filler. Anybody got any more questions? Yes, Chris. Is there a, are there changing requirements for supported JDKs underneath either version? Yes, there are. Um, Tomcat 8 requires Java 7 or later. Um, as of this, did, it, did the Java 8 stuff get into this release? Yes, I think. Yes, it did. No, it did. It did. Um, it, got, it, it, it got into the release that um, didn't get released because we found it was broken. Then it got fixed and put in the next release. So, yes. The current release of Tomcat 8, the next release of Java 7, um, sorry, if Tomcat 7 will let you run on Java 8 and let you, you, if you run on a Java 8 JDK, you'll be able to use Java 8 syntax in your JSPs or, or your servlets. For Tomcat 6, if you want to use Java 8 syntax in your JSPs, you have to, a, you obviously have to be running on a, on a Java 8 JVM, but you also need to replace the JDT compiler that ships with <coughs> Tomcat 6 with what, the one that ships with 7 or 8. The reason, the reason we can't put that one in 6 is Eclipse have, uh, have compiled, compiled that jar, so it now compiles all of the classes with Java 6, and Tomcat 6 has to run on Java 5, so it throws class version exceptions. So, and we have to be able to, Tomcat 6 has to be able to run on Java 5 by default. But you can, you can you with the next release, you will be able to run it on 8, and the next Tomcat 6 release is going to happen just as soon as I apply the last patch in the status file, then I can start the release process. Who's using Java 8 in production at the minute? 7, 6, 5, 4, 3. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of about what I'd expect. Um, OK. Right, well, I'm around for um, the rest of the day. In fact, the rest of this week, um, I'll be at the bar camp tomorrow. I'll be at the Tomcat Summit on Friday. Um, I'll be hanging around here for the rest of the afternoon. I've got another talk at the end of the day anyway. If you've got any questions, if anything occurs to you, then do come and find me. But for now, thank you very much.